Uh, first, before I uh, start with uh, my demo, um, I want to thank Dennis and, and Kevin for uh, starting this this meeting uh, back up again. This has been a wonderful resource, I think, for um, us to Astro Imagers as a forum to kind of ask questions and, and get some feedback. Um, so I really, you know, thank you to both of you for for, for taking this on and, and leading the way. Um, let me share screen. This is a demo. Um, and as you might know, demos can be great. <laughs> Sometimes they can be, um, they can be, uh, uh, you know, have issues uh, at times. Uh, but so, so bear with me here. Um, so yeah, this is um, the Astro Imaging Planner that I um, developed starting, I don't know, like three years ago. And it really, it came as a um, kind of a want for my end. And then it turned into a need as I started to do more imaging um, where I wanted to be, be able to plan my imaging sessions in a more efficient way. Uh, and then later it evolved into something a bit more um, comprehensive and, and complex. The starting place of the Astro Imaging um, Planner was basically just this portion, which is um, showing uh, for any given night in your location, uh, the path of the moon over time. So the horizontal axis here is uh, time, and then the vertical is altitude. And so you've seen plots like these in, um, you know, like Nina or um, some tools online uh, show them as well. Um, but they're usually for single objects. And what I wanted to do was to know when a certain object rose up, uh, above an altitude that the other object is falling so that I can switch from like object A to object B and then carry on for object B. And so there was no solution for that um, out there uh, that I've seen. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why I, I built this. Early on, it was just a, a quick um, little utility that I wrote in, in Python and visualized it in a um, what's called a Jupyter notebook, which allows you to interact with the code and everything. Um, but then later I pulled it into an app and then, um, and you know, have it in this uh, more evolved astro imaging app. So you can change the date. Um, you can adjust the, the date and, and this will um, update accordingly. You'll have different, um, you know, the moon will be farther uh, along. This is a couple, uh, about a week and a half from now. The moon is a slender crescent uh, with phase, what, like two, two percent or something like that. Um, and uh, you can see how, um, you know, as, as you change the dates, the, the objects uh, change their, their arc across the sky. Uh, one thing I connected this with was um, the Voyager uh, database. It's called RoboClip. And in RoboClip, you, uh, you store the different targets that you want. So you can store like M42, M45, the different things you want to image, and then you can call them later in your sequence to um, to get to get them imaging. Um, also, this does interface with Nina and Sequence Generator Pro sequence files, so it's not just a Voyager specific thing. Um, you once you point the the target directory um, point to a certain target directory, as long as it has a RoboClip database or um, one of those SGP or Nina files then it should be able to pull in the targets and visualize it like this. Um, quick feedback, is, is the size of this okay? Are people seeing this okay on the screen? Yep, okay. Yeah, it looks good to me. Sweet. All right, so um, the idea here is roughly like, you know, uh, at this time the moon is down, maybe I wanna do some dark nebula. There's a Draco dark nebula complex, Bernard 150, um, maybe a Taurus dark nebula complex, which is over here. So I'd switch between these different targets over the night and say um, this would be the timing around which I would start to do that transition around 1.50 in the morning. Uh, so I would go into my sequence files and set the stop time for this target, Bernard 150, to switch over to another target, um, the Taurus Dark Nebula uh, complex. And in that way, I can maximize the amount of good data that I'm getting because it'll be high in the sky um, over this over this time period. Whereas before, like if you use um, some other tools, it'll just show something like this and you have to best guess as to where that transition might occur. So that's kind of like the, the planning aspect of it. Um, that does integrate a bit more with the data acquired portion that I'll go into in a little bit. Um, 
basically part of this uh, planning also has uh, some filters. So like I want to filter only for um, objects that would have luminance. And this reads through the um, through the uh, through the notes in the robo clip. It doesn't really interface really with um, actually the new luminance isn't working right now. It doesn't interact uh, with SGP or Nina, but it does for, for Voyager. Um, and it pulls in only only um, targets that have, in this case, um, a narrow band. Uh, so these all have narrow band. They have like HA03 or S2 filters uh, for them. And so if you know that the moon is going to be up, then these would be the targets that you would want to uh, want to acquire. So that's one um, one aspect of this. Uh, the other is that we can set um, target status. So within each of these targets, you have um, I have like labeled status of pending, active, acquired, closed, dropped, or just a testing frame like. Maybe I'm doing testing for some spacing or something. Um, so, like the active um, uh, active targets that I'm shooting now are I see thirteen eighteen, LDN twelve thirty five. That's the dark shark, uh, Vandenberg one fifty two, the lobster and bubble nebula complex, and then Sharpless two sixteen. And so these are the ones that I would be um, on a sort of night to night basis, looking at timings and making sure that they're. Uh, maximally covering each one and getting as much good data as possible. Uh, and then I can change their their status and priorities down here uh, accordingly. Um, this is uh, most of the the planning aspect. Um, uh, some of the uh, planning aspect has been, I guess um, it's still it's still worth going through, but uh, there are some advances like uh, I know Voyager Advanced is is one that sort of takes control or makes it completely autonomous in the target selection. Uh, Nina has an advanced scheduler as well, but I believe you have to manually select the timings so that you end you know target A at a certain time, then begin target B immediately after. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, those who use Nina, but um, I think that's the that's the case there. And in which case, you probably you know you could have some benefit of having a sort of all in one picture of your targets like this. Um, and then there are some other uh, little settings down here, like depending on the data that I have um, and the targets that are selected up here, these tar these data will show down here and they're associated with the targets up here. For example, IC1318. There's uh, the IC1318 data that I've collected so far. And likewise for, for the other guys as well. Um, uh, we can do have certain thresholds like minimum moon distance. So when the moon is full, we want to stay well away from that. We can increase this to make sure that any targets that are displayed are not close to the moon. Um, and then some other uh, other timing and, and uh, advanced settings down here. Um, so this is more or less the planner aspect of it. Uh, we can change location um, and that will change the your latitude and longitude, and then it'll also read the sky brightness from an internal sky atlas, um, and from that we'll adjust sort of contrast settings that'll uh, tell you what objects are are probably best to image. Um, and uh, there's also a built-in weather forecasting thing. It's just a quick little thing. This is from the National Weather Service, and then there's another pop-up that comes from clear uh, outside. Um, and kind of give you a, at a glance view of uh, the weather ahead. So this is the, the planning phase. Um, any questions on this? I, I do have one question, just yeah. honestly through the planner as a whole, um, just through the software as a whole, I'm assuming you need Wi-Fi to be able to run it, right? You don't need Wi-Fi to run it. You do need Wi-Fi to interact with the, um, the weather because okay, that, but that everything just pulls else... it from the web. Everything else is local, yeah. Okay, and then can I download it? I can just, I can just put it on my USB drive, for example, like the actual like zip file, and mm -hmm. then just put it on a computer. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's all in one. It's yeah. It's all uh, all in one binary. So <laughs> are you able to send me? Are you able to send me the link to uh to the planner? Yeah, it's a, it's it actually on, in our Slack group. Scope. It's in the planner app uh, channel. Oh, the okay. most recent uh. Uh, uh, file there. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, hmm. Dave, that's what I was on. Maybe that's the same question, just asked a different way. Is this a standalone application where you yes. need like Python or something installed in the background to run it, or, or is right. it just the executable that I install? Like, 
right? So early versions of this of this app, um, I used a more sort of sophisticated setup just to get it running. Um, and this isn't that, it's an all-in-one installer. So you double click the installer, you go through the steps, it installs, it installs support for like Microsoft Access, which is how we're able to interface with the Voyager RoboClip data, database. Right. Um, but if you don't have RoboClip or you don't worry, you don't need to worry about that, it, that doesn't matter. You don't need to install that, but it, ins it installs everything else. Um, so there's no uh, Python you need to install. There's no, um, and it is built on Python on the back end, mm -hmm. but it's just compiled in a way that it, what you see and what you have to deal with is just the installer. Uh, once that's done, then um, then you're off. Mm -hmm. So, so Gabe, uh, yeah, Steve and I were were talking about, uh, and I think Kevin ran into the same issue. Uh, with Access, you have to have the 64-bit version. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I think it depends on your your computer, but yeah, it's. Uh, I think the one I installed on my personal uh, Windows machine was 64-bit too. Yeah. Okay. So, Any other so, comments, questions? Yeah, so could you, uh, on the left side, uh, could you scroll down uh, to, yeah, right there. Um, yeah, so I, I, I've always been mystified by, by, by these minimum frame. Could you go over these? I mean, the moon distance, I can understand. Yep. <laughs> minimum but, frame overlap fraction. That, I mean, some of the, so I'm not like a, um, Front end developer by by day or anything like that, uh, so you have to um, bear with me on some of these um, descriptions. But what this is is, um, say you have a, a frame that your image is taken with. In the center of that frame is a particular spot in RA and declination. Okay. Um, and then the target, if the target is say um, uh, within seventy five percent of the frame, uh. then it, then it matches. And that's what this meant. That's what this means. Okay. All right. If I move this to 25, then the target can be anywhere within the uh, middle 75. So it'd be 25% away from the edge of the frame. Uh, if I move it to zero, then it can be basically anywhere in the frame. Okay. okay. And, um, the, and the extinction coefficient? <laughs> yeah. So this is early on. I, I was building a way to. Um, to show like how much contrast is being affected. So if you, so there are other uh, Y axis values here. One is air mass, um, which if you're looking straight up is air mass of one. If you're looking at, a, I believe like 30 degrees above the horizon, the air mass is two, meaning that you're looking through twice as much atmosphere. Ah, okay. um, the next one is sky brightness. And I put experimental in all of these, um, in these latter two. This one is like the magnitude per square arc second, um, but it's done so not from a measurement, it's from some sort of um, empirical formula uh, that takes into account the altitude of the object, um, the local light pollution. So for example, the local light pollution here is 20.14 based off the map. And so my sky brightness saturates around that value. If mm -hmm. I were to um, go to, um, somewhere that's a lot more dark, say in the middle of Lake Michigan. Um, then you see here the Bortle value is three, the sky brightness is 21.8, and then the sky brightness increases to that value. Um, and so if I change the date to something like today, uh, where we have the moon, then the sky brightness changes. So when the moon rises, the sky brightness tanks, and that's what you see here. And then the contrast is just the relative sky brightness, like compared mm -hmm. to how you're the ideal for that location. So um, uh, an object that at zenith uh, with no moon at that location would have a relative contrast of one, and then everything relative to that would be you know, below one. So as the moon goes up or as the, as the object goes down into more air mass, then this contrast will, will decrease. Mm. So these are ways to kind of get a feel for um, the local conditions when you're shooting an object um, in, in the sky, whether it be through um, hmm. you know more air mass or, or a brighter background. And then so going back to this extinction coefficient, this is exactly what we were talking about in sort of the um, before the um, before this demo about uh, the smoke. So the smoke would increase this to like some some very high values. Um, 1.2 is probably way too high. 
but what this would show is um, the relative contrast. This would be relative to um, basically fully transparent air. So we'd have a, a significant reduction in contrast because of that in increased scattering through aerosols or smoke. And that's what the extension coefficient does. Okay, cool. Um, solar altitude for nightfall, that just tells you that when am I, when am I gonna start shooting? When it's um, ideally, if you're in the perfectly dark spot, negative 18 degrees is called uh, astronomical twilight or dusk um, or, or dawn, dusk or dawn. And um, you can adjust this to your location. So for me, I know around 14 degrees below is when I should start shooting. So at that point, um, it's it's not dawn, it's not dusk, it's not nautical dawn or dusk, it's it's something in between. So that's when I know that the sky is gonna get no better because the sun is sufficiently below the horizon that the local light pollution swamps any, any other improvements. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Cool, thanks. Okay, yeah. Any other questions on the planner portion? Well, Gabe, uh, I just tried to install this last week uh, for the first mm -hmm. time. Um, since you made it compatible with Windows, and and uh, I, I'm having no luck. I cannot come up with anything that is similar to what you're showing on the screen here. I get something totally different and some and quite a bit more limited. I mm -hmm. I hate to. Uh, I hate to uh, waste everyone's time at this point, but I'm wondering if in the future I could maybe uh, contact you and get some assistance here. I'm not sure I have the right files. Yeah, sure, of course. Download, um, but, uh, and I did have that issue with access and I had uh, 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 Office in a 32-bit and um, I did, I did determine that I needed 64-bit access in order to get the thing to work, but um, I'm still having a number of issues. So I might just drop you a note and yeah, be great. Uh, you can help me uh, walk me through it. Yeah, no Gabe, when, you, when we install this for the first time, the, the data that you have, all the objects that you have in this database is zero, right? We have to add That's those. That's correct. That's correct. I don't know the very you, first step you, that you have realize that. Yeah, the very first step um, is going into settings and utilities. <clears throat> and then this first box is um, where you put the target directory. So right. you you copy the path to the target directory it could be um, Voyager, uh, SGP or Nina files. And that's where that goes. And then the second box is where uh, all your data lives. And really just to get it going, you just need those first two. Uh, the the other ones are for calibration and then pre-processing. I'll, I'll do a demo of that in a little bit. Steve, um, do but, you use Steve? Do you use uh, Voyager? Okay. No, I haven't gotten into Voyager yet. I'm still a uh, sequence generator. I've been out of that it for a period of time, and I figure, well, I'll get the sequence generator going first, and then I'll go to Voyager after that. So that may be one reason why you're not seeing similar because you just don't have any, any, anything in your database. Either. Could be another reason why I should do voice tag into Voyager. Well, it's not just that. It's just you don't have any objects yet. Target set. Um, okay. So Gabe, I, I guess I might not be getting this completely clearly. It Does it only integrate with Voyager or can you integrate with everything? You can integrate it with Voyager. Um, Nina and SGP. Okay. SGP files, as long as it's after, I think like five years ago, they, ch they change from their SGP file format. Uh, but okay. after that date, it's, I mean, if you have a current version of SGP, it should be fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll be all right. I mean, I hope that's not five years old, though. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> it shouldn't be, and we'll be all right. Now, I don't know. Does SGP have to be 64 bit also? I don't believe so because um, you're not. We're not interfacing directly with the SGP application. We're interfacing with the the files that SGP stores, and that's in a specific format. Um, it's in I forget mm -hmm. exactly. I think it might be an XML format, but it's a. It should be readable by this program. Okay, you well, might be wondering just, why I have so much thirty-two bit stuff, but some of the uh, software that I'm using is is not uh, compatible with the sixty-four. So that's why I'm mm -hmm. stuck where I'm at. Is the database? Okay. Oh, Sorry. Go ahead. 
Okay, uh, I was just wondering, is the raw fits data directly once you do the analysis on the files, does that save? So let's say you move the files somewhere else, or do you always have to connect to the, you know, have all your fits files on one spot, um, always connect to it? Yeah, once, once you start um, this application looking at that directory, it will be change that you make. So for example, if you move files out of that directory, uh, it'll notice they've been removed and then remove them from the database. And the reason for that is that there's an interaction in the, the inspector where you click a point and then it pulls the file. And if the file isn't there to pull, then then it's um, you know, it, it wouldn't be able to render that. So uh, I would suggest that you know if you if you regularly change your uh, files in those directories, like you move them around all the time, mm -hmm. um, then that might be you know that might be a pain point. But uh, what I often the, the way I look at the data is that uh, I dump all the data to one directory and then don't touch it. That's that's what I consider my raw directory, and I should never sort of move those things around. They're just kind of frozen. Um, and uh, in, in that way, when, uh, you know, when you do have issues with like, you need to get, you need to get new data, you still have that old data there. It's not gonna be overwritten or anything like that. Um, does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Let me go through the, the inspector. And I think this, is, this was the, what I was referring to is like it evolved from a planning thing into an inspector app. Um, and I think the, probably the most value out of this thing is through the inspector. Um, it shows you uh, what's happened the past night. It can allow you to compare night to night, like what kind of nights are crummy, what kind of nights are really great. It allows you to more objectively evaluate uh, your data. Um, and in addition to that, it, it, can, it has another, uh, a few other um, kind of nice things uh, with it as well. So, um, the first thing over here, this is like the command center where uh, we can choose different dates, um, uh, different targets, filters, sensors, uh, focal lengths of the scopes that you've uh, used to acquire data, pixel sizes, image types like light frames, master frames, bias, darks, and so on. Um, and then over here, once you select something like this, you get a you get a display showing your targets um, that you've imaged, and then the total uh, integration. Um, and in this case, uh, for example, I see 1318 on this day, I acquired two, two hours of data for H alpha. Um, you hover over that and you see that it's uh, using a ZWO uh, ASI uh, 2600 on a uh, FSQ 106. Um, and then there's uh, another set of data here for 03 that's below zero. And what that indicates is that this is data that not, did not pass my kind of acceptance criteria for being quote, good data. That I would use for, um, you know, integrating to get a final master, and uh, so some of this evaluation is done um, by comparing um, data that's being processed on the file. So what internally what this does is that when you load new files, when you load new files in the, you know, you set this raw directory here. Uh, it looks through all the files and. It uh, processes them. It looks at the star shapes. It looks at the star distributions in the frame and calculates a lot of different statistics. And based on those statistics, it'll kind of grade each, each frame. And if those um, statistics are bad, then it'll reject them. It'll show up as below the, the zero line. Otherwise, it'll show up as above the zero line. Hmm. Um, and so, uh, on this axis, we have uh, every subframe from that night. Um, the horizontal is full width half max median. And what this is, is it's the, the median full width half max of the star shape over, all, over the entire frame. So there are maybe thousands of stars in the frame and this is just the, the typical uh, star size uh, in, in, uh, in that frame. And then this is the eccentricity. Mm -hmm. And the eccentricity is just basically how flat the the star shape is. If it's a perfect circle, it's zero. If it's a little bit flattened, the eccentricity goes higher. And the way that I um, I set these thresholds um, over here, so as you change these values, there are several different values here. As you change them, uh, the different frames will come into and out of um, the acceptance criteria. 
So for example, if I reduce the max eccentricity, which is right now set to 0 0.6, if I reduce that to 0 0.45, then everything will update and a lot of the data will be rejected. But I think that's pretty aggressive. So usually I set it to 0 0.6 or even 0 0.65. Um, so that's one example of, of using these criteria to kind of bulk um, assign like whether the frames are good or not. Uh, there are other data here like minimum star fraction. Uh, what that is, is um, of those frames, say you took 10 frames of luminance and um, the top frame for luminance for star number is like has maybe 10,000 stars in it. And then as the night went on, you got more and more haze or more and more smoke comes in and your star count starts to go down. And what this says is that the below 50% or below half of that maximum value of 10,000, uh, that's when we start to reject that those frames. So if we get a frame that comes in at 4,000 stars instead of the 10,000, that's rejected because the clouds are starting to eat away at the signal. Um, and then there are some other statistical quantities, z-score, this is like a, a bell curve type um, um, score. So we want the star full with half max to be no more than five sigma away from the, uh, from the, from the group. Um, and uh, IQR uh, scale, this is an outlier rejection method, uh, statistical based. And um, I can share after this, I can share um, a little bit more detail on how that's calculated. Uh, trail threshold, this is um, a metric that I came up with that measures how aligned the star shapes are and how elongated the star shapes are. If the star shapes are elongated and aligned together, that means that you may have um, tracking issues, guiding issues, or maybe wind, where uh, all the stars are kind of in one direction. Uh, and then gradient threshold, this is like if you have a nearby street light or the moon or you're imaging too close to the moon and you have a very strong gradient across your frame, then um, that that's something that would probably want to be rejected. Uh, so you're going to play with these and, and adjust them as needed. These are just kind of, I think, kind of good starting places for them. Um, and uh, in addition to this, you can, um, in this full with half max versus eccentricity plot, you can change the X and Y axis to almost anything uh, anything you want. So for example, um, we can change this to date. Uh, so we have now date versus eccentricity of all the objects, and then we could change this to full with half max. Mm -hmm. And so we can see um, how the night, as the night progresses, what the full with half max is doing. So typically if like the same bad over the night, you'll see um, the, full with half max start to rise uh, over the night. And I've seen that. So when I usually, when I image, I image with uh, two or three telescopes. And uh, what's funny is that this, you know, modulation in the full with half max will be seen in all of those telescopes at the same time, indicating that it's not like the mount because I have uh, two different mounts that's running. It's actually the sky that's um, mm -hmm. increasing that, that, uh, that bloat in the stars. Um, so you're actually measuring with this kind of view, you're measuring the, the real sky performance that way. So, yeah. so Gabe, uh, on your date of observation, is that, is that still UTC? Yep. It's UTC. Mm -hmm. Any, any reason for that? I mean, um, there I mean, are, is... yeah. So there are a few things. One is, um, <laughs> I could, I, I you know, <laughs> one is just me not getting around to it, uh, to make it into local. Uh, the other is that I do have a mode where you're doing a in, inspector only mode, and in order to know um, where uh, where you are, you're going to need to know that latitude and longitude. And the target planning has the change location portion of it. <laughs> so uh, we can, you know, I can add like a UTC offset to to do that manually, um, but I've just never gotten around to it. Mm. So I think a lot of uh, astronomers when they like. Well, at least at planetary, they they often report their um, their timings as UTC anyway. So I didn't oh, see sure. a real big need to put it into local time. Yeah. Okay. Um, we also have presets like uh, quick options here: full with half max versus date. These are all for these uh, these plots over here. Versus eccentricity. Um, if your image acquisition program reports altitude and azimuth in the FITS header, uh, you can show that. Um, so you can show 
uh, the object azimuth along here and then the altitude along here. Um, star count versus sky background. So these are quick views that are, are kind of interesting to see. Um, focus position versus temperature. It's interesting because it, if you look at this over a long period of time, you can actually, a long period of time or, or a night that has a lot of temperature differences over the night and you refocus regularly, you can, you can actually read your telescope or your system's um, uh, contraction as the night, cool, night cools down, how much uh, contraction is needed in order to stay focused, and also your filter offsets too, uh, if, if those are applicable, it's kind of neat. Uh, sky background versus altitude is also there. Um, you know, there are a few other things that I have down here, um, but, but yeah, they, they allow you to get a different view. And of course you can always change these manually as well. Hmm. Um, let me go back to full with half max versus date. And so the other thing, we already see a visualization down here, but um, as you click on some of these points, um, the data down here will change. So it'll pull in the, the raw frame. And this is in reference to, um, to what we were talking about earlier about uh, pointing to the right target directory. That file should be there so that it can be pulled when, when you click on these points and you can do a frame inspection. So this is like the aberration inspector in PixInsight where you have a, a three by three panel. Um, this, this view, you can also zoom in to get a better view of uh, what the stars look like. Uh, double click to zoom out. And so for example, uh, this is the aberration inspector. On this side is the frame analysis. And this is something I developed where um, you have this color coded grid, but that color coding is uh, for this, this axis, it's uh, you, looking at the ellipticity, which is similar to the eccentricity. And the, the more red it is, the more extreme it is. So there's maybe one sort of region in this frame that's that's more extreme than the others. Um, if I click on one, let me go back to eccentricity versus what was that? If I click on one that has high eccentricity, we see on the right side for this frame, uh, there's more elongation. And if I zoom in on, on those data, you can see that there is a bit more elongation in the horizontal direction, which is mirroring what, what the uh, the frame analysis is showing. You can also do full with half max uh, instead of um, uh, ellipticity and also eccentricity, um, showing the same kind of idea. So, so um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so so explain. You know, when I see that asymmetry, uh, mm -hmm. where you where you see some of the darker colors on the right and lots of blue on the, on the left. Uh, yeah. yeah, if we pick 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 out a, a a better frame that that you know that would be a non a non rejected frame. Okay. Um, there's another. There's a way that I can add in multiple dates. So I'll just get a lot of data here and, and try and pull something bad. So here's one. Um, this one I think is just probably wind because there's everything is in yeah. one direction and it's all yeah. kind of aligned. Um, yeah. so no, uh, my, my, my concern is when the heat map shows a, a you, you actually had a better example when you had less data there. Um, maybe something like this where it's decent over here and not so great over here. Yeah, so explain the, explain the, the asymmetry. Um, I mean, that doesn't that doesn't imply a, a tilt or anything in the sensor, right? Or can it? Um, it could be it could be tilt. Yeah, it just depends on. Um, I think it depends on your setup. It could be tilt. It could be spacing and tilt. Um, it could be miscollimation. Um, okay. Yeah. So asymmetry. Asymmetry. Um, I mean. I'm surprised to see asymmetry in your setup. Oh, well, my setup isn't perfect. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't think, I mean, that's, that's one, that's a lot of the feedback that I got from this app is that um, yeah. once you start putting frames into it, you think that the frames are good. You start to see all the kind of warts that are in there. And right. I wouldn't really call that. I got, you know, I just did, but I wouldn't call them warts because um, as you stack your frames and integrate them, a lot of this stuff gets sort of swept under the rug. Um, yeah. if you're just looking at one frame and it's a common pattern, 
where like you do a meridian flip and that that's still there and it's still strong and extreme um and you stack it and it's still visible that's the problem mm -hmm. you know um but this will help you diagnose that like okay. if you do a rotation and you find that this is on the same side then that's indicative you know that the that the sensor for example has tilt mm -hmm. whereas if it switches over to the other side then that means that the imaging train may have tilt mm -hmm. so okay yeah um so this is a way to to get a a quick view of all the data that you have um there are some kind of summary statistics on like how many data points in here i have 635 subs uh, about 76 hours of total exposure and then some other you know accepted rejection um mm -hmm. statistics on that mm -hmm. um there are some things that we can also do with this uh let's see like actually let me get rid of this and go to m27 um so for example this is m27 i've been working on this slowly <laughs> um and there's this um if you have downloaded this app called Cyril, S-I-R-I-L, um, it's a it's an app that can do uh, image processing for astrophotography. But the really nice thing about it is that um, you can script it in a way that um, is a lot easier to use than, for example, PixInsight. Now, uh, what I'm going to suggest here with this pre-processing is that it's not a replacement for PixInsight because you're going to do a more careful and more thorough job in PixInsight. What I use this for mm -hmm. typically is to gauge, you know, if the data looks good enough for total, you know, processing um, and and getting an image at uh, at the end of the day. Um, and in fact, I've become lazy enough that when I hit this button, that's usually the frame that I use is the frame that spits out out of serial. Uh, so when I do this, it it uh, does a variety of things. Um, this requires us to set this directory, the pre-processed pre output directory. Mm -hmm. And so this is under, um, let's see, let me pull this down. Um, oh, sorry, you're seeing my app and not the, let me, let me go out and then desktop one. Can you see? Can you see the um, pre-processed window here? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So there's pre-processed here, and um, I'll go to Frame Inspector for M27 and hit uh, Process Accepted Files. And so what this will do um, is it'll start for M27. Um, a process that will have all the darks, flats, and, and lights pulled in and start to do the calibration. It'll um, make masters of your calibration files. And these are linked to uh, the set that is used for, for the darks. So there's a specific code here that is only unique to this set of, of darks. And if you ever reuse these sets of darks, it'll always reuse that master file so you don't have to reprocess all those darks uh, over again likewise for the flats and, and biases if, if you use those um, so 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 gabe can uh, now i throw away after after i do a, a, a dark i throw away all of the you know and only save the masters so can you put the masters in 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 here as well in the um in the in the calibration calibration uh, folder um <clears throat> oh i see what you're saying uh i think if you, as long as you keep the um these master calibration in that you know in those same file formats then it won't matter yeah yeah because i i don't you know i don't i don't you know once i do a dark series i don't I don't mm -hmm. save, you know, once I create the master and in picks insight, I, I, you know, I throw the raws away. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I try to keep all the raws um, so I can recombine things in the end. Uh, mm -hmm. If I ever lose masters or anything like that. Um, it'll, what this process does, it's already finished. Um, what this process does is it pulls all the masters, or sorry, <laughs> all the bias, flats, darks, um that 
are uh, applicable to this particular uh, instrument. So this camera, this uh, focal length for the flats, it matches the filters. So that way you can run like three or four different systems hmm. and it'll know what files to gather um, to apply to your sets of lights because hmm. it, it knows what, what data is available in the FITS headers and matches those accordingly. Um, so yeah, uh, what this is, um, what this is done for in 27 is, is combine everything. So it combines like a pre-processed flat for O3, a pre-processed flat for HA, uh, a registered, uh, flat, uh, registered light for HA and O3. And, um, sorry. Uh, and so these are, these are the files that are, um, that are present. And so there's a report also that, that gives you the, the, the list of darks that are used, the list of uh, flats that are used for these, and then the files, the, the lights themselves. Um, and in here, um, let me pull this down if I can. Fix in sight. Um, this is the HA, um, 75 minutes. Um, and then this is the O3, which is two hours. So yeah, again, um, it didn't take that long to, to process these. Admittedly, there's only eight files here and, and what, like five files here, um, but it's uh, it's a lot faster than PixInsight. And again, the idea is just to get going, just to get an evaluation of what the data looks like, to know if um, if you want to keep going or if you if you want to say that's good enough, I'm done. Um, and then, like I said earlier, I'm I'm kind of lazy, so I just end up using this data anyway for processing. Um, I was just going to ask that. So you use Cyril now as your pre-processor. Yeah, yeah. And then I pull everything into fix inside and then take over from there. Yeah. Is Does that use a, a weighted batch pre-processing similar uh, algorithm or is it more straightforward? No, I think it's more sort of just like combine everything. Yeah. And th in this way, it's, you know, you're rejecting the bad data, but it's not on a sophistication of uh, fix inside where you do have the weighting. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, probably unnoticeable though. Yeah, I'm assuming that, um, I mean, well, I, I would think that in the future, Cyril will have that capability. I think it's actively being developed, so. But it's been around for a while too. <clears throat> so I I can tell uh, that I, I'm, I'm one version behind because you you've in this latest version uh, you've you've changed the layout uh, significantly. Yeah, yeah. Before I used to have all this stuff up here, right? But this sort of side by side thing, I I don't know. I think it's it's better for spacing. I don't know. It's just yeah. it's, it seems better to me. So did um, you what, uh, in in yeah. this version uh, fix the? Um, uh, there was a a little bit of a bug in the in the scatter plot um the the new data would keep being entered if you're if you're doing uh, a particular parameter versus uh date and time mm -hmm. uh, uh, at least on the version that i have all the dots would start to march outside the outside the graph and then oh, you, okay. would have, you would have to refresh the graph switch to a different set of axes and then switch back and then then they would all be in the graph again okay i haven't seen that bug um in recent development you know recent builds so i think that should be solved so okay yeah um so um i don't know if, if you wanted to go out but practically you say in the planner is is where uh, is there an install, a basic install, and then an, a different upgrade um, utility for yeah, so, upgrading the versions? Yeah, in the past, what I've done, because uh, if you want, you know, the light pollution map, that's actually quite large. Um, mm -hmm. So that is what balloons the installer. Um, okay. If you, if, if I do an incremental release where it's just like a bug fix or something like that, that's not uh, a large... Um, change to the code base, then I can just have a, a uh, like an update um, installer where it's, um, it's a lot smaller to, uh, uh, it's a lot smaller file. So it's quicker to install and 
you know, there's not as much downloading and, mm -hmm. and even build time for on my end uh, yeah. to get it packaged up. So, so, okay. So this sounds, sounds kind of silly, but could you go into Slack and I haven't been able to find where the new version of the software is at. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this isn't, let's see, this isn't actually the new version that's, that's up here. Um, oh, what do you know? We've hit our 30 day or 90 day limit on the planner app, I guess. All right. Well, there you go. I'll send a, a new link after the meeting. Okay. For the, for the, for the, All not, right, not so, for the one here, because I don't have one built for this one, but um, for the, the one that uh, was there previously. Okay. So, so that'll, that would be, so you'll let us know when we would need a full installer versus an update, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll lay that out. Yeah, okay. All right. So, so I wasn't going nuts, like, of not, not being able to find it. It's just, it's gone from, from Slack. Yeah, it's, the, it's the Slack thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Limit. <laughs> I recently did that. Yeah. You know, I'm starting to get sensitive at my age. Um, <laughs> uh, when stuff disappears, I don't know whether it's me or the software. <laughs> All right, cool. Cause because the, then the 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 new update will will have this screen layout and and, mm -hmm. and the yeah. uh, and the pre processing. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, you have to have Cyril installed. Yeah. That that I, that I that that I have installed. Yeah. Yep. So all right, cool. All hmm. Cool. Any questions? Uh, it looks like a lot of fun working on this. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a labor of love, and um, it's been a lot of fun getting it together. And uh, yeah. it's, it's even more fun when all the data comes pouring in, and you just sit back and watch the plots update, and you, yeah. you know you're getting good data. Whereas sometimes in the past, it's like I don't know how tonight's going to go, and you know. Hmm. So, so Gabe, uh, does the help button work on this version? It does. Um, this is an older documentation. So there is documentation here outlining kind of uh, some of the statistics that are that are used. Um, like also, here's a link to the IQR scale, the Z-score, things like that. But yeah. right. um, it is a bit older. As you see, it's uh, it has the older uh, layout, right. which uh, can be updated. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, no, I meant I meant the help up in the in the in the in the tool uh, in the title bar. Oh yeah, this. Um, let's see yeah, this one. yeah, yeah. So there's. Uh, so where do I find the the version? Is it used to be an about under that help, but it was always dimmed out. Hmm. Yeah, I see that now. Um, yeah, I can add that. Yeah. <laughs> Again, uh, <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not even a software developer. I'm, so this is more of a uh, of a hobby. To, to pull this stuff together sure, sure um so i you know it's a it's a bit non-standard but but yeah i can add that oh no i i you know you just want to know whether you've got you know the the most the most recent because i didn't know whether i had because i couldn't find anything else in slack i didn't know right. whether i had the most recent version of the of the of, of the of the frame inspector um, if you go to settings and utilities and just tell me what this this value is, or is a commit hash? This is what we use internally to track versions. Of ah, oh, just tell okay. me what that is, and, and then I'll let you know what version you yeah. have. All right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. No, I don't mean to add to your plate of things to do. I I just was just <laughs> no trying to make sure I was. All I want to do is just stay current. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Um, yeah. So I just saw a question, where is it downloadable from? And I think once you put the new link, you just click on the link and it downloads directly. Is that right? Yep. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So for, for the newbies in the group, though, they'll, they'll, need, they'll need the basic install as well. Yeah, they'll need the full install. Uh, the, the updater is only applicable with, if you already have um, the full 
version installed. So are you, are you also going to post then the, the full installer repost? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, cool. Gabe, just a real basic question, which is probably a stupid question. When you have a frame that's rejected, um, where, where does that go? Is that something subject to um, uh, your capture right. program or is that something that you're doing here specifying it? Yeah, so let me share again. All right, say we have uh, this frame. Um, I made a decision for this app to never uh, move any data. And there have been a lot of requests to have data move so that it's in more convenient folder locations. Um, but I believe that this app should not modify any data that you collect, uh, any raw data you collect. And that's something that I'm gonna hold firm to because um, you know I don't wanna be responsible for any data that's being destroyed. Um, so this data just lives where it was dumped when the acquisition software collected it and dumped it. Uh, when I do the pre-processing, um, if you look into here in, in Max, I'm running a Mac, and in Max there's this little shortcut um, uh, you know, symbol. So these are actually links uh, to the data. Uh, the size, of the, these are not the actual uh, real files. Um, but they're just links to where they exist on your on your hard drive. So we're not duplicating data. We're not eating your uh, hard drive space or anything because we're moving data around. The only way we are eating hard drive space is by creating these new, you know, master files and and uh, and master uh, master lights. So um, yeah, that's one thing I, I wanted to not do is is you know move or modify any of the data that you you have. So. <clears throat> the acquisition software puts it all in, say, a directory. How do you distinguish between what's been rejected and what's been accepted when you look at yeah. those 20 or 30 frames you collected last night? Right. So uh, when the data gets dumped there and once the astro imaging planner is, is looking at that folder, it continually looks for new files. And once it finds a new file, it parses it through the star extractor and all that stuff to get the statistics. Then based on what you select here for these thresholds, um, it will adjust internally in memory, the flag for that file, whether it's a good file or a bad file. Okay. One, one thing I didn't touch on is uh, down here, there's the show tables button and it has a bunch of table data. Uh, it allows you to do a summary of like um, by object and filter, like how many, uh, how much data you have, the number of subs, how much, dispersion in your CCD temperature there is. Ideally, you want this to be as zero, close to zero as possible. The average eccentricity, star orientation, and everything like that. But you see uh, the sub-exposure data. So this is, this is the aggregation. And then this table down here is everything at the sub-exposure level. <clears throat> this last column shows you the status, so that flag. And when you're pulling the pre, when you're pulling the files to do the pre-processing, it only selects those files with the flag that it's OK. To, to use, and those are exactly the files that are that are um, above above the zero here, or that are filled in uh, and are solid here. Anything that's You're, open is a rejected uh, sub exposure. So, if you are going to, going to um, process in um, PixInsight, is that mm -hmm. flag one zero? Is that something that when you're going to go select, you can see, or is that in the fit setter where? Um, that that flag is um yeah that flag is not i think accessible by pix insight the reason for that is that i'm not setting that in the fits header okay um it, it goes again to the you know to the philosophy that i don't want to modify any of your data i should i should have a separation of your data that's raw and any any flag status that i have in the app um, what you can do is go into um, go into here and say these are the lights that have been selected as being good. Then have Pix and Site point to this directory instead, and it'll pull those files. It should pull those files. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. That's that. That's that's clever. 
Yeah, right right now, Kevin, I've been doing it. Uh, you know, I basically, you know, Gabe gives a little uh, symbol when it's bad. And, you know, hopefully I only have like maybe three or four bad subs uh, through through the night. And uh, so I, I, I've just been clicking on it, getting the file name and 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 then just deleting you know the you know moving them into a reject folder uh, but this little scheme of having the usable fits uh in that pre-processing program would eliminate having to do that good thanks that that helps a lot Plus, you should mention, Gabe, that this program is is an ego buster for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's it really humbles you. That's, it, it's yeah, a it's very cool. humbling program, yeah. <laughs> uh, especially the heat map gets 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 gives gives me sometimes kittens. Um, <laughs> But very good, very nice. Or, you know, yeah. all the hundred different things that can go wrong. Yeah, right. so, yeah, so Gabe, this is a perfect example of what gives gives me the shits. Mm -hmm. um, is I'll, I'll look at a heat map like this and, and I'll see the majority of the map is all blue, but then I'll have a corner or one side mm -hmm. that, uh, and I'm wondering, no, and, you know, what is uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So, yeah. so why is it why is there this asymmetry unless there's something physically wrong? That I'll, I don't understand. I'll, I'll wait till Gabe is done and then I'll yeah. probably have something that I want to share. So. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, so I think that part of this could be could be tilt. Uh, one thing that I have seen in some of my frames is that you'll have a region in here that's usually has like a line feature where it's very low eccentricity. And then the regions out here on either side have higher eccentricity. And usually that, mean, that means that there's some amount of tilt going on. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's part of it. Uh, the other part of it could be, um, I mean, if it is only tilt, then you should expect it to be on this side, but you also see some elongation on this side. So there could be some spacing issues too. Um, at least that's my read of this. Mm -hmm. Now to fully, um, I think to fully understand if it is tilt or if it's not, um, this tool that Nina came out with, they have an extension called um, Hocus Pocus, which allows you to, from what I understand, allows you to measure, do a V-curve on, on every corner of the frame. Mm -hmm. And if the V-curve tells you that you have different, um, different best focus spots, uh, that they're you know, statistically different from each other in the different corners, then that tells you that you do have tilt. And you should correct for it. Well, what's what's concerning to me is click on a click on another data point. I mean, uh, it, it's when I see it coming and going that I don't 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 understand. Yeah. Okay. okay. Th there, there's a great example. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. So why why. <laughs> Why did that trouble corner, that that northeast corner trouble, go away? If it's something in the optical train. Well, that probably yeah. means that you have something that's moving, right? Okay, I mean, that tilt in that frame was real or tilt or whatever in that frame was real and then it changed, right? So that how means- can you, how, can you, how can you partially move a piece of the frame. How can you? Yeah, if something the... moves in your optical train. You would have. You would think that it would affect the entire frame. Well, where's your object in the sky? Yeah. Right on a one frame to the next. You have gravity affecting your your system. Yep. In different differently ways. from night to night. Yeah. From side of the pier to, to the other side of the pier. Yeah, so this is uh, alt, uh, altitude oh, versus azimuth. Okay. So this is the early in the night. Um, this is M45. So uh, yeah, early in the night, it looks 
looks like this. Um, reasonably decent. Also, this is multiple nights too, so this isn't exactly a okay. comparison or anything. And then later uh, in the night on the other side of the meridian, it has this effect. Um, so there are more stars, I think, in this because the boxes themselves are smaller, um, but the patterns look a little bit different. So there is a little bit of um, mm. flexure, I guess, okay. but not the flexure that you, you would typically think of like your guiding is really off or something like that. Yeah, um, okay. This is very, I think, very minor. Um, and to the point that I honestly don't even worry about it. <laughs> I mean, if it if it right. yields a stackable image that looks good, then I, I don't care. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this pre-processing thing, so I can look at it and say, is yeah. this really an issue? Because you could go down rabbit holes all day and find out why is this corner right. looking so bad. Um, right, and then and then sometimes it doesn't look bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, that's that's I guess where I'm at too. I mean, obviously, when you zoomed in that corner, you could visually see that the star yeah. was elongated but yep. after you process it would you have known it was there if this thing didn't amplify it it might be amplifying problems that aren't really problems yeah so when you when you actually calculate the full width half max um of a single frame it's almost always at least in my case worse than the final stack frame right so mm -hmm. The eccentricity numbers typically of single frames for me are in the 0.4, sometimes even 0.5 range. But for the most recent image, the stacked H alpha frames were all, you know, 0.35 and so on. So. Yeah, as you stack, the eccentricity should go down. Yeah. Yeah. So, so based, so what you're try, kind of alluding to, again, depending on the altitude and and what side of the meridian you're on, you're saying that there's flexure and gravitational effects on the sensor? Not on the sensor. Okay, so maybe I'll or make the, a comment. the optical train? Yeah, maybe I'll make a comment here, Gabe, with your permission. So, um, so I guess the way that I look at tilt, right, and I've been reading, you know, Hocus Pocus, Focus Focus, things that Chris White and others have written. So tilt and at least for a refractor, we should probably think about tilt and spacing as kind of related, right? Okay, because if you look at one corner of your sensor, if the distance, right, okay, from the field flattener is different than the other corner, yes, it's tilt, but from the perspective of that corner, it's a spacing issue. Does that make sense? So if your sensor is tilted, right, okay, the distance between that point, that part of the frame, and the sensor is different, right? Okay, than from let's say the opposite corner of the frame. So really you have both, you know, you can think about tilt as a, you know, in that corner as a spacing issue. Does that make sense? And that's really how Nina's Hocus Pocus is looking at it. Basically, like you said, what it's doing is it's doing V curves on the four corners and the middle. And it's finding out you know, where the point of best focus is for each one of the corners in comparison to your center, mm -hmm. right? So if your corners all achieve perfect focus at the same point as your center, then your sensor or your optical train is perfectly, you know, symmetric. Does that make sense? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> you know, when do you have tilt? Let's say if the top left achieves perfect focus at a, you know, ahead of when the middle, right, okay, and the bottom right away, right, okay, then you have tilt. Does that make sense? Because you have to rack the focuser away to achieve perfect focus in the bottom right, but towards for the top left. Mm. Right? So what it's going to report to you is how much each corner had to be moved in relation to the middle to achieve perfect focus for that corner, okay? If all four corners have to be moved by the same amount, then it's a pure spacing issue. Mm. Make sense? Sure. But, yeah. <clears throat> but if, all, if one of the corners has to be moved ahead, the other behind, then you know you have, you know, 
spacing as well as tilt. If the sum of all four corners is essentially zero, then you know your spacing is exact, but you have a tilt issue. Hmm. So that's based on looking at one frame. To no, go. no. What it's going to do is it's going to move your focuser. Okay, so there's a certain point that your focuser will achieve perfect focus, let's say for the center. It's going to generate, you know, let's say nine different frames. And you can program it so each one of those nine frames can be the average of, let's say, five or whatever, right? Or one. So you get a V curve. And for each one of those nine frames, it is going to do a focus analysis of each one of the four corners and the middle, right? And that gives you five different focus curves with five different minima, four for the corners and one for the center, hmm. right? If the minima coincide, right, of the four corners and the center coincide, essentially if the curves stack on top of each other, and you can see this in Chris White's write-up, okay, then you know you have neither tilt, okay, nor spacing issues, because essentially everything is coming to focus at exact same point mm -hmm. in the focuser, right? Now, if your sensor, or really doesn't matter, your optical train is tilted, your edges are going to achieve focus at different points than your middle. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. Right, because, you know, if my sensor is tilted, it really doesn't matter if it's a sensor or any one of the connections, right? Okay, if the optical axis of the field flattener is not completely parallel with the optical axis of the sensor, whether it's due to tilt in the sensor or something else, the distance between the field flattener is going to be different, okay, for the corners versus the middle. And you, if you have tilt, it's going to be different for each different corner. Mm. So that's what it's doing. And it's a purely mathematical way. So I actually tried this. I actually tried it the other night. It's really easy. It's, you know, what you do is you basically just, it's just literally the click of a button and it'll go through and it'll generate the, you know, all those weakers and it'll tell you how much each one of the corners had to be moved to get to perfect wow. focus with respect to the center, okay? Now that's focuser steps. That does, that's not directly correlated to spacing, right? So it'll tell you that I have to move the focuser nine microns to get to perfect focus on the top left versus the zero point being the center, right? Okay. But that doesn't mean that I need a nine micron spacer. It just means the focuser needed to be moved by that much. Mm. So you have to do trial and error to get to, you know, what's mm. the, uh, you know, what's the exact spacing that you need. But what is nice is that you can just add spacers or change spacing so that you can get the curves to stack. And when they stack, you know that you're at the optical, you know, optimal performance of your system. And what, what was the name of this program? Something Hocus Pocus? Yeah, Hocus Focus, F-O-C-U-S. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's an add-in in Nina, right? Yeah, it's an add-in in Nina. So the way that Nina works is, um, when you download it, you can go to the add-ins page um, and um, there's a number of add-ins and the two that I use are the three-point polar alignment, which is really nice. And, you know, I've started to use Hocus Pocus, so. Yeah, okay. So this is a this is a Nina thing. This is a Nina thing, yes. Yeah, okay. I, I can't, but, learn, but I can't you, learn another. No, no, another but you don't now. need to, but you actually don't need Nina, right? Okay, Nina makes it automatic, right? Now, um, what Chris says is you can actually, all you need really is to save the, is to rack your focuser and save the frames, right? Nina just automates the process. So what you could do is you could save each one of these frames and use an external program like ASTAP to, you know, essentially get what the full width half max is at the four corners and the center and do those plots manually yourself. Hmm. But it's really, really, really easy <laughs> in Nina. So yeah, okay. Well, it's doing it. Just one last question, and that's what I meant by more than one frame. I, I misstated. It's looking at 
say one spot in the sky, but if you cross the meridian you, and, and so forth and ran it again, perhaps you'd be able to diagnose the flexure that uh, uh, Gabe was alluding to as, as a possibility. I think you could probably diagnose that it's there. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly where it is and how to reduce it. I, I think that's a more complex yeah, yeah. topic. Yeah. Uh, so, so hey, hey, Kevin, how about we end on a pleasant note, uh, <laughs> uh, and and talk about you know I've I've volunteered to have to host the first open house for observatory visits, and so. Were we going to discuss on, you know, what the best day and night or daytime or weekends or how, how do we how do we how do we launch this visit your friendly observatory program? So it's a good question. Yeah. Just to maybe frame it a little bit is, you know, what are people's preference? Do you want it, you know, late afternoon twilight on a Saturday on a Sunday? I think. Dennis, you had mentioned maybe a, you know Sundays make sense. So day of the week, time of the day, and then volunteers. And I think D Dennis has already volunteered. So I know in previous in other clubs, you know, like you're saying, I know this is a astronomy topic, but it may be more value added to have it during the daytime. Oh yeah, it's yeah. No, I, I it out loud. yeah. Right, so I, I and I, you know, you kind of make it fun too, right? So you you one sure. option you could do is maybe you you know you meet at eleven o'clock or something on a Saturday or Sunday or something like that. Spend an hour talking about the person set up, and then you go out for lunch or something afterwards. Right. Yeah. Whoever's available. Yeah. Make it. Make it. Day. Make it a more of a. Kind of a social event as 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 well, right? Another Not option. You know, yeah, go ahead. Another option. Uh, my observatory is up in the Wisconsin Dells area. Nobody's going to go there, but videos and photographs and do something like online here would work. Too. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. There's no reason we can't do both, and and I think that's, you know, for. Um, for some of the more remote areas and so forth, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I was going. I was going to throw out as as kind of a. I just look at my own schedule and in a lot of my friends' schedules. Uh, um, you know, Saturday is typically not a not a good day for anybody. Um, but um, you know, but other than football now starting. Um, you know, three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon or three or four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon for, for an hour or so. So it doesn't interfere with, with uh, you know, the early Sunday plans and, and, and Sunday evening. And I don't know, I was just, just throwing that out. That would, you know, that's kind of a dead zone time for me, Sunday afternoon. I mean, um, so I don't know, but I, I agree. I, I'd like to have it during the day so that so that we can you know you can actually see the hardware and 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 you know play with the play with some of the toys. So beyond Dennis, any other folks that would volunteer um, as follow-ups? You're all welcome to come down to my place. <laughs> it, it, it took me two and a half days though kevin <laughs> yeah and that you you drive pretty fast it takes and me drive <laughs> oh. so by the way i did share in the chat um the link to what i just talked about oh okay oh great great thank you <clears throat>